Well, good morning. Um, thanks for inviting me here today. Uh, thanks for allowing me to escape Clark Summer, Pennsylvania, uh, where I have spent the best part of the last five months trying to not get frostbite, um, which is a very sad state of affairs for someone like me who enjoys the sun. So coming here last night, I already had the opportunity to just dash down to the beach real quick, take a couple of selfies, send them to my family, make them pretty jealous. And um, you guys get to do that all the time, so that's, that's fantastic. Um, so I have appreciated getting to meet some of you already. Um, thanks to Dr. Ebert for allowing me to spend this time with you in discussing a topic that I've always been fascinated with and in more recent times have had the privilege to be able to teach, and that is about culture and about cultural intelligence. And over the next few days, today and tomorrow, I hope to make the case for you to consider why it's important for you to consider culture and cultural intelligence. Why you as a Christian leader, both in the present and in the future, regardless of your vocational choice that you may make, you need to understand and appreciate the importance of cultural intelligence and the implication this has for Christian life, service, and ministry. This is not just about people that want to go into the church and be pastors and be missionaries. Um, it's of course important there, but it's important for every facet of life and regardless of vocational choice that you may make. So I want to start off today by attempting to define what it is we mean when we talk about culture. Now, when you try to define culture, it's a bit like trying to define leadership. Because when you Google it or when you look at any leadership book, they're going to provide you with a definition of what leadership is. The same with culture. Many of those definitions are pretty good, pretty useful. So we can spend the whole morning just giving various definitions, which I'm not going to do. But I want to start by giving you what I think is a fairly useful working definition that we can go uh, with. And this comes from Nagel, who says that culture is the ideational and material aspects of social life, language, religion, ceremony, myth, belief, values. They are the substance of a people. So it, it sounds a little complex, and it is actually very complex, but this idea really is the way in which life works for a specific group of people. Perhaps it could best be described in the following way. And that's pretty much how it works. We know that things work a certain way, but we don't always know why they work this way. And that, friends, is the complexity of culture. So it's not a perfect definition, but I do believe it does point to the idea that culture is indeed complex. It involves many different areas of life and is, in a very real sense, interdisciplinary, which is why I want to approach things from an interdisciplinary perspective in the next couple of days. 
I've dealt with many Western missionaries over the years and when you get in conversations with them sometimes you will hear the anecdote that they share that is certain groups be they, be they African tribal groups or Chinese Buddhists they often complain about after the time that they have spent with them building churches and ministries and they leave they descend into what we call syncretism which is essentially an attempt to try and assimilate gospel identity or Christian identity with a previous religion or a culture and that is certainly something that occurs however I think often this lament reveals a lack of understanding about the pervasiveness of culture and how for many peoples of the world one simply cannot separate religion from culture those two things are intertwined and I'll also contend with you a little bit later perhaps tomorrow that we in the West as Western Christians we're often guilty of exactly the same thing but we don't always see it but we'll get there so what then does it mean to be culturally intelligent? The competency known as cultural intelligence, or CQ, which I'll spend a lot more time talking about tomorrow night, is a fairly recent phenomenon. And I want to show you again just a very brief video that better illustrates the genesis of cultural intelligence. When the originators, the original researchers of cultural intelligence began to explore this field, they asked themselves this very important question. And that is, what's the difference between individuals and organizations that succeed in today's globalized, multicultural world and those that fail? I think it's a very, very crucial question. I've asked myself that question many times of cross-cultural workers that I've encountered over the years. Why have some become so successful at creating sustainable initiatives and ministries and organizations and others not so much. What is it? Is it personality? Is it luck? Is it divine favor? Is it a combination of those things? I think CQ has a lot to do with it. So when we talk about CQ, here's what we're measuring. It is the capability, the capacity to function effectively across various cultural contexts, be they national, ethnic, organizational, generational, etc. So because culture is so complex, even right here in this room, we not only have a variety of different cultural backgrounds, but we also have a Christian subculture that in which we exist, and there's also a Clearwater Christian College culture, right? It's something that's unique to this school that is different from, say, BBC or Rutgers or Princeton. So you may have noticed that the people in the video and that the organizations represented there, those that are really asking these questions the most right now are those in the business and higher education worlds where the bottom line ultimately is the bottom line. Beyond just the idea of DNI, which is diversity and inclusion, which is a very important concept, companies are realizing a very important trend, and that is multicultural or culturally diverse teams actually outperform monocultural teams. And that's why if you go to Silicon Valley and you go to Facebook, you go to Google, you go to places like that, they are filled with different types of cultural backgrounds because they are among the few that have realized this and they, of course, are succeeding. So how does this relate to the world of Christian ministry? I want to address that more specifically tomorrow. But for now, however, I want us to spend a little bit of time starting right at the very beginning, or at least close to it. S.D. Gade said, when we think of the church, we must conjure up a picture not of people like ourselves, 
But a people of all colors, shapes, and ages, women and men, speaking different tongues, following different customs, practicing different habits, but all worshiping the same Lord. That is the church that Jesus sees. So whose idea is cultural diversity? Well, it may be said that the first example of cross-cultural ministry is found in Genesis 1, when God created them both male and female. If you've ever read a book on marriage, or you yourself are married, you might understand why we say that is the ultimate cross-cultural ministry. Men are from Mars, after all. But is culture part of God's design, or is it a judgment that is best exemplified in this curious story that we find about the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11? And I want us to just unpack that for a few moments. It is an interesting story that you've probably heard in Sunday school, but probably haven't spent a whole lot of time thinking about since then. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 11. We want to look here real quickly and unpack a few elements of the story in the little bit of time that we have this morning. Genesis chapter 11 and verse 1 says, Now the whole earth had one language and the same words, and as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let's make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they'll do, and nothing that they propose to do now will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down there and confuse their language so they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them there from over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. It's an interesting a uh, slightly obscure story that sometimes we're not sure what to do with so we tend not to do anything with it. But the question that this passage and, and, and other comments like that beg for us is, is this cultural stuff, this diversity stuff, is it a God thing or is it a judgment? Now, some, like uh, Sherwin Lingenfelter has written a book on, on uh, actually a number of books on cultural engagement, and he talks about culture as being a prison for disobedience, that the whole world is a prison of sin, borrowing from Paul in the book of Romans. And the idea he conveys in his research is that because sin is present, there is no worldview, there is no culture that can be considered neutral. Culture, he says, is contaminated by human beings, and so what then is the solution? Do we create a Christian culture, a gospel culture, some kind of supra-cultural exchange where we all fit? Does one take a high view or a low view of culture? Do we see it as a judgment? Well, I, I offer a counter to Lingenfelter from Charles Croft, and I know D.A. Carson has written some stuff about Croft as well, so I'm not going to get into all that, but what Croft does is he, is he helps us understand that sin is a reality, we know that, right? And because of that, it has led to the abuse and the misuse of cultural norms and values. But maintaining that culture is a prison is slightly misleading because it insinuates that a person cannot escape from their cultural parameters. And this is simply, in my opinion, not true. Because in fact we even have words like countercultural that we use. And what do we mean when somebody is acting counterculturally? We're saying that somebody has actually been able to respond in a way that is not the norm for their culture, but they're responding in a certain way anyway, against the culture. So a person is not trapped in this prison cell they cannot escape from. They do make choices. And it's the choices that people make within that grid that determine the goodness or the badness therein, not the culture per se. So I contend that that's the problem, is the misuse of culture, not the very existence of it. So back to that with, back to the story of Babel with that in mind. Um, a recent friend of mine, Sung Chun Ra, wrote a book called Many Colors, Cultural Intelligence for a Changing Church, which I highly recommend you read. And he talks a little bit about Babel in that book as well. And there's a couple of things that we need to look at when we're thinking through this story. And you can uh, spend the rest of the time talking to your Old Testament Hebrew profs about that later. But I'll just give you a few things. First of all, any good Bible student would know that the first thing you do when you approach the text is you look at the context, right? So if you look at the immediate context of chapter 11, we find chapter 10. 
I know that's pretty profound, right? So, chapter 11, chapter 10. And what we find in chapter 10 is the so-called table of nations after the period of Noah. And those tables of nations, i.e. races, are already delineated in this passage. So the idea that this diversity creation was a judgment, a punishment, doesn't seem to make sense since those nations already existed. And if you go back to the story itself, you find in verse 3 and 4 that humanity's desire was the problem here. Their desire was to make a name for themselves. Come, let's make a name for ourselves. We don't need God. Not to make God's name great, but to make their own name great, which is a very contra the very contradiction of the missio Dei, the mission of God. And God's response is not so much a judgment I will submit to you, but it is a deliberate reorientating, a deliberate recalibration of His resources to get His people back on mission. By confusing the language and scattering them on the earth, they were now in a better place to spread the news of His fame. And ironically, well, not ironically, but you look at the chapter after chapter 11, which is chapter 12, and I really got my math right today, we find this chapter about the call of Abram. And what was the call of Abram about? All the nations will be blessed through you. All these scattered people will be blessed through the work that I'm going to do in your life. So this recalibration of God's people at Babel placed them in a better position to serve Him. So, as Ra goes on to say, the variety of cultures that arose out of the scattering of the people is not the punishment. Instead, the vari variation of cultures is part of God's plan for calling humanity to be faithful. So what exactly is this plan, this vision that God has? Well, in one of the most beautiful passages that we find in Scripture, we jump all the way from Genesis to the last book in Revelation, where we find the idea that at the end of times, when God has done His work, we find passages like this, where it says, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches, which they got down the road here, and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God. There is a multicultural culmination to the mission of God, that He has come to rescue, redeem, restore, and put to rights this world, and that we should be very thankful for. Now a lot has been written and said about the mission of God over the last 10 years or so, using the Latin phrase, missio Dei. What is this mission of God? Very simply, it is the story of the Bible. David Bosch once said that mission is the mother of all theologies because it is out of a correct understanding of God's mission in the world that we can correctly understand all the other ologies, ecclesiology and soteriology and such. But for us today, unfortunately, in our Western Christianity, when we think of mission, we often think of missions, which is the context of people going out from their country to another country to plant churches and do missionary initiatives, etc. And that's usually all we think of when we think of the word mission or missions. But missions is actually a subset of mission. Missions is the multitude of activities that God's people can engage in, regardless of vocational choice, that are ways of participating in the mission of God. God's mission, friends, is even bigger than the church. It is not so much the case that God has a mission for His church in the world, but God has a church for His mission in the world, so says Chris Wright. And when we think of the magnificence of that task, we must also contemplate the power of a multicultural church. This thing that Silicon Valley has begun to realize that culturally diverse teams outperform monocultural teams. We in the church should wake up to that reality and say, hang on, this is not something to be merely tolerated or understood or we kind of take it you know, in the workplace. We have to take these courses to make sure that we're keeping up with our KPIs or whatever it is that we, we have. But it's something that we should embrace and seek after and rejoice in the fact that God is doing this through his church. Because we've been invited to participate in God's mission, we must, I believe, do so with great verve and gusto so that we can echo the words of Paul when he says, I become all things to all people so that by all means I might save some. Part of that, I think, is to become culturally intelligent. So it's interesting that way back in 1910, the World Missionary Conference issued this statement as they sought to move beyond some of the intrinsic racism from inside and outside their own ranks. 
They said this, It's therefore clear the missionary needs to know far more than mere manners and customs of the race to which he is sent. He ought to be versed in the genius of the people, that which has made them the people that they are. And I think that's such an interesting phrase, the genius of the people. This is not just about tolerating. This is about embracing the genius of multiculturalism. Later, a few years later, uh, one of the first missionaries uh, to uh, inner Africa, the Methodist missionary Edwin Smith, advocated for the use of anthropological insights in mission when he stated that the science of social anthropology should be recognized as an essential discipline in the training of missionaries. And he goes on to note, right at the end of his quote here, which I think is very interesting, he says, tact is not enough, nor is love. Tact needs to be based on knowledge. Love, there can hardly be without understanding. And that, I think, is a very profound thought from uh, 100 years ago, just about. And that's what I hope to, uh, especially tomorrow, talk to you a little bit more about, is that how do we grow past just the CIA fact file knowledge pieces of different cultures and different countries? Oh, they like this, they don't like this, they eat this food, they don't eat this food. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is actually appreciating what those people, whoever those people are to you, can contribute and must contribute to your understanding of what it is to be a Christian, what it is to be human. Do you love people enough to want to understand them, is the question. Do you love people enough to want to hear what they have to say? Are you even willing to consider their points of view? I teach a class on world religions, and one of the ideas I discuss in that class is that we must understand the position of our fellow humans who happen to be Hindus or Buddhists, etc. Know them. Know their beliefs as well. Earn the right to be heard. Because, let's be honest, how many of us would consider changing our whole world view and our whole way of seeing the world from someone that didn't really know me, didn't look like me, didn't understand me, didn't even seem to really care to know what I thought or felt about pretty much anything, but wanted me to trade it all for a new message they were sharing? I doubt whether any of us in this room would put up our hands and say, sure, I'll listen to what that guy has to say. But yet we expect that of people of different religions and cultures all the time. Consider how cultural intelligence could help us in our broken world today. We live in a day of ISIS where we lament, rightly so, the slaughter of 21 innocent Christian people a few days uh, or a few weeks ago. But we're virtually silent on the fact that ISIS also slaughtered 45 Muslim believers that same time. We don't hear about that. In a day of, of Ferguson where people are extremely polarized in their opinions, in wars, in the name of religion, political misunderstandings, we as the church need to show how culture is not something to be feared, but embraced. It's not something we should shy away from or try to tolerate, but it's something that we recognize in the advent of the story of Babel, in the advent of the multicultural culmination of God's plan and revelation, that we can say, man, this is God's design to have diversity. So let's embrace that in accordance with God's design and for His glory. And we'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. So thank you for your attention, Aaron. Further. Uh, so the students here are studying everything from exercise sports science, uh, psychology, Bible education, um, pre-med, all those kinds of things. So why then does cultural intelligence matter beyond, say, uh, interpreting the news? Mm. Yeah, I think that for the, the very fact that I mentioned earlier about the fact that multicultural teams are outperforming those of the monocultural. Um, and that, that speaks volumes to the idea that uh, there is a, there's a value that we get from understanding people's perspectives that are different than our own. Um, so whatever vocational choice it is that you make in life, that is less important than how you go about living out your vocation. Um, so 
I think there's very few, if any, fields, and we'll talk about this tomorrow when we talk about how um, technology, and especially social media, has squashed the boundaries that we have today to almost nothing, that our ability to function effectively across different cultural capacities is, I would say, an essential skill in the workplace of tomorrow. So, it, it, you know, people today in, in, in our generation and the generation before us, that may not have been seen as such an essential, um, but it's definitely an essential for the world of tomorrow in the next 20 years. Uh, tomorrow I'll share some information about the demographic switch in the US and how in about 20 years time there'll be no clear majority in the country. Um, in terms of one particular culture group over against another. So that means we're going to be a really, truly a melting pot of different cultures. And that's the society in which you live. Okay, let me push that just a little bit. Sure. Um, so with the exception perhaps of Dr. Clem, none of us in here at this moment are leading an organization. None of us are in Silicon Valley. And in the immediate years ahead of us, probably are not. Uh, the kind of thing where we're assembling a corporate team where we can affect diversity, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So, for students here now, for many of us employees who are here now, what is what do you want us to do both to understand cultural diversity better and to do something about it uh, tomorrow or this afternoon or next year, those kinds of things? Sure, yeah. Uh, I think, you know, you just look at the church. Um, the church has such a great potential to model uh, reconciliation, you just look at the last slide I showed with all, you know, you just turn on the news, inevitably there'll be some kind of conflict. I was watching the news late last night and uh, caught up with this whole thing that happened at Oklahoma University, you guys are probably familiar with that, uh, racist chanting by one of their fraternities. Um, this is happening in the last couple of days, you know. So, you know, what do we as a, as a church, as the people of God, what do we do with that? You know, how do we respond to that? How do we talk to our peers about these things? How do we talk to our family members? How do we begin to engage with each other in a way that promotes reconciliation, in a way that promotes peacemaking, in a way that shows and really demonstrates uh, the love of Christ? That is relevant for everyone in this room. Um, and I think very often we are more informed by our news outlets, <laughs> you know, one in particular, uh, who shall remain nameless, <coughs> Fox, um, but, and less informed by the scriptures, you know, and so we need to allow the scriptures to really speak and, and in some cases root out some of the bias that we have as individuals. Good. Um, and on that topic, you and I spoke a bit yesterday, and if you're going to talk about this tomorrow, feel free to punt. Can you uh, address a bit of those unconscious, bi unconscious biases that uh, we have, and then how we go about uncovering them, and then perhaps even what to do once we uncover them? Yeah. Um, I'll give a great example of that tomorrow, so I don't want to give too much away now, but uh, we all are biased, right? Did you agree with that? We, we all are biased um, because of our upbringing, because of where we find ourselves uh, nationally. I mean, you just, you just think of the idea of patriotism. What's the best country in the world? <laughs> there you go. Right. Now that's not a biased response at all, is it, right? I mean, you know, so y you talk to somebody from, from the UK, like my parents, for example, if I asked them that question, they'd say, well, of course it's England, you know? Look at our heritage, look at our history. I mean, Shakespeare and the Beatles, what more do you want, you know? Um, so they would say that it's their country. Every one of us thinks that w where we come from and what we have and what we bring to the table is better than. And so what we need is other people, but preferably people who are not like me, to help me unpack that. Because you know, you and I, we may, we're different in terms of culture, but there's a lot of things we also would have in common. Um, we need people who are different than us to help me see my blind spots and my, my prejudices and my biases, and through the gospel allow those things to be transformed. Um, but to say that, you know, I'm not biased, I don't have any prejudice, that's just, a, that's just an untrue statement that needs to be addressed. Okay. So you spoke moments ago about embracing culture. Can you offer us a definition of what that looks like, or perhaps even the term cultural engagement? What are we talking about when we say that? 
Yeah, I think, you know, um, when we talk about cultural intelligence, first of all, it's, it's the capacity to function effectively across different cultures. So that presupposes that we acknowledge that different cultures exist and they're worth engaging with. <laughs> so that's probably the first thing we need to realize is that if you don't think that they exist or are worth engaging with, chances are you're not going to be very culturally intelligent. Um, but I think the idea of embracing culture and the diversity is, is what we see in Revelation, what we see in Genesis, is this idea that God has deliberately deliberately place the different cultures the different types of people on this planet and in this country uh, for his purposes and his design so my job then as an individual Christian I think personally is to get on board with that and to say okay it's not about you know what I think what I like this is about God's mission which is bigger than me and always has been and so how do I get on board with God's mission um, and that, I think, is the idea of embracing cultural diversity, is, is go beyond tolerance, go beyond diversity and inclusion, which are good things, um, but I think they sometimes lead us to ticking boxes. Uh, oh yeah, I did that training. Yeah, you know, because sometimes in, in, in educational circles especially, you know, you have to do the training so you can understand how this, these people view this and view that. That's not what I'm talking about. I think we need to go beyond that to say, I need to learn a different way of processing. And somebody else who's not like me can help me do that. And I can help them. Yeah, thank you. Um, so when I hear culture, I go one of two places. I either go SNL and like Top 40 Music, <laughs> pop culture, or yeah, pop culture. there's high culture, like there's much culture in Opera House, Yes. There's, there's do you have culture, and that yes. really means do you listen to opera and these kinds of things. Yeah. So when it comes to engaging those kinds of expressions of culture mm. versus culture perhaps in its purest forms, how do we think about those things, or perhaps what's a rubric for thinking about those things? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I think what you're kind of hitting on there is the fact that when we use the word culture, um, it's immediately defined in different ways. So like you say, you do have pop culture, you do have what you say, the high culture, where somebody is cultured if they attend operas and things like that, you know, getting a bit of culture in you, uh, which is what my parents always used to say to me about watching things like Faulty Towers and the BBC and things like that, which I don't think is quite correct. Um, but I, I think for us, um, how we define culture um, on a theoretical basis needs to be um, much like the clip that we showed. Uh, it is the substance of a people that make you who you are and cause you to respond in ways that you're mostly unconscious of. So if you caught in the clip there, he says, well, these are our traditions. This is what we do. This is how we do it. This is why we do it. Uh, well, this is what we do. And why do we do this? I don't know, you know, but I just know that this is the way life works for me. Um, and to understand that that's not a problem, that's not a bad thing, but understand the way life works for you is not the way life works for everybody. And maybe the way other people do life has something to contribute to the way in which you do life. And I will say this too, maybe end with a bit of controversy, I think it also affects the way in which we read the Bible. Because I think we, we have a lot of our unconscious biases that come into play. And we in the West tend to read the Bible very individualistically. What is God saying to me? What does God want me to do? How does God want me to respond? And those are very egocentric questions. When most of the authors of Scripture were not thinking that way. They were saying, what does God want for us, the community? And even the words that are used in the Greek text are often plurals, not singular. But we just overlook that and think, well, God wants me to do this. He wants me to do that. Well, thank you. Let's give uh, Dr. Meekins another hand.